So, uh, Matt, you uh, have COVID. Your kids have COVID. Um, Let's look at this tweet from Nate Silver. Um, We're talking about teacher unions and we're talking about basically teachers in San Francisco, a bunch of teachers not supported by their union necessarily, um, decided not to go into school. In part, one of the things that's going on is that, I mean, I can tell you, my uh, kid's teacher out with COVID. My kid's principal out with COVID. I would imagine there's a but like his class size now is down to like almost like 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 I don't even know if private schools have class sizes this small. Uh, but he's got like almost one third less the kids in his class right now. Um, like he's got like eight kids in his class because uh, people are out with COVID. So so much of this is just about the actual functioning of a school. And yet there are people out there who are just insisting that uh, go back to school. Put, put up this tweet. So uh, Clara Jeffrey, she's uh, I guess she works at Mother Jones. Uh, right. She said uh, a lot of liberal pundit hand wringing of the uh, to the effect of uh, we can close schools now uh, that we know the great harms uh, uh to kids' mental health, which, yes, but um, is anyone pushing closures that aren't solely prompted by staff shortages due to their own infections? Which is, I think, like, what we're starting to see. Like, there's a lot of people out with 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 COVID after the holidays. And um, uh, Nate Silver wrote, suppose you think that school closures were a disastrous invasion of Iraq magnitude or perhaps greater policy decision. Shouldn't that mer- merit some further reflection? What is going on with this dude? <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. But, you know, the way it's phrased is, you know, who should be further reflecting if you think that? And perhaps it should be you, the person who thinks that it's a Iraq level magnitude. Well, she also responded with with this uh, point, which is uh, you think this was a policy decision, which, of course, is totally decentralized one. In other words, there's nobody in Washington, D.C. saying the school district in San Francisco, the school district in New York, the school district in Chicago, the school district in Boston should shut. Um, and she says, you think this was a policy decision equivalent to the deaths of 460,000 people? That's a, you know, I, I think a contentious number. A lot of people think it's two to three times that, uh, frankly, from Iraq. <laughs> Let's just call it half a million people and the destabilizing of an entire region. And do you think parents and educators have not been reflecting for fuck's sake, I think is what FFS means in that in context. This is the thing that's bizarre about it, is this silver is like comparing this to Iraq for whatever. And he goes, yes, I think depriving tens of millions of school children of an in-person education for a year or longer is absolutely on that magnitude. No question. Now, first off, that happened a year ago. There has been no, my kid in New York, and you know this, Matt, they've been going full-time to school since September. In fact, my kid since last, I don't know, April has been going full-time, both my kids. Oh, right, right. Uh, besides maybe a few weeks where there were uh, scares in the, the actual school my son was in, he, last year, he attended almost a full, an entire school year, besides what I just mentioned. This year so far, uh, entire year, except for one week before the holidays, where again, there was a scare in that particular school. In fact, just his class had to stay home because it was just in his class. And the teacher actually ended up getting it. And she had to work remotely from her home because she couldn't go in and teach while she's COVID positive. This is the bizarre thing that seems to be going on now. It's like that 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 none of these people who are who are outraged by this are recognizing the fact that there are no lockdowns that exist in this country right now, to my knowledge. There are no uh, complete school closures. There's what we're seeing is that people are asking for a spot, sort of like narrow, temporarily narrow um, capacity for remote learning during like a surge i mean it's to me it's the equivalent of like uh, again of like there's a hurricane going on or a tornado like you know it's gonna rain on either side of this and i'll send my kid to school in the rain but if there's a tornado outside i'm gonna keep him home the the truth is uh, a lot i'm not gonna say all 
Oh, but a large portion of these people who are talking about this school closure thing simply have no idea what's going on because they don't even have kids or kids in the public school system or in the school system, any school system. I mean, this is the same thing we saw just a few days ago where conservatives thought they were like owning AOC because she was seen outside at a bar drinking without a mask on, as if you can't do that in New York City. Newsflash to conservatives who don't live live in New York City, you can walk around New York City outside without a mask on. You could sit down at an outside establishment and drink a mimosa or whatever the hell you want without a mask on. You don't even need a vaccine passport to do that outside of a restaurant. You only need something when you eat indoors in this city. But they don't know that. They think they own AOC. So the same thing's happening here. You have people who don't have kids in school talking about how kids must go to school as if there is some sort of nationwide school closure. When again, we're just seeing school, particular schools. And in some cases, uh, cases, it's even more minute than that, where actual just like the grade that had the COVID positive student, not even the whole school is staying home. Uh, and that's because the specific school or that specific uh, whatever the school board or if it's like a private school, I guess the dioceses or whatever, um, they make those determinations. No one in uh, federal government. What's also interesting is that at least in, you know, I mean, I have my kids have friends who have private school. I know people who go to private school. It seems to me that all the private schools, they all plan to be remote this week because they knew everybody was coming back from vacation and they wanted things to settle out. That would have been a great idea, too. But there's just a sort of like hysteria about what's going on. Um, And yeah, has it been difficult on kids? Of course. Do I want my kids in school? Yes. In fact, my kids are in school. Um, my daughter's, you know, been in and out over the past week because it's just a crap show where she's going. My son's going in, but it's not like there's much learning going on right now because half the staff is out. Right. Right. I mean, in my son's school, basically, the teacher is currently posting uh, the home, like the schoolwork online, like on Google Classroom, which is something they only did previously when they were fully remote. But the school's open this week and they're still doing that, which means there must be so many people who are not in the school, even though school is open, that they've made the calculation that, hell, we have to do this as if we were remote because so many kids are just not in right now. Yep. I think what's interesting about no go, ahead, no, go ahead, Brandon. Go ahead. No, I mean, I think it's what's interesting about all of these people who are handwringing about kids in school is that they, you know, they dance around what they actually want, which is the, that teachers work sick because that's the that's all they can possibly want because like we're saying there's no like coordinated lockdown across states or federal government for like kids to be out of school and remote learning this is you know a staffing shortage that is compounded by years and years of uh you know educational uh neglect by our state and federal government now being revealed by the pandemic and a lot of you know liberal pundits and a lot of you know liberal parents and just parents across the board have been conditioned to think that schools are free babysitting service and maybe that is the the role that they provide for a lot of people practically. But in the case of a pandemic, you know, it's time to reassess what that actually means and how feasible that is the way we've structured society. Because like all that, you know, the dancing around uh, of Nate Silver is doing it. Well, yeah, let's say you do think that it's an Iraq level disaster. Let's say if you are that stupid, like what is your prescription for solving that problem other than having uh, teachers work with COVID in a classroom, classrooms that are were too densely populated before COVID and have not been properly outfitted with the, you know, the prerequisite uh, HVAC systems that they were supposed to get, if that would help. Like, what is your actual prescription? But, you know, they just want people to make that leap of logic themselves. And in some senses, you would just wish that they would be like, yeah, I want teachers to work sick. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I want them to work sick. We got to bomb. We got to bomb the teacher's spider hole where they're all hiding in until they come out. And that's when we got to force them back to go to school. Like, this is just ridiculous. Like something you said, too, about, uh, you know, that whole thing about, uh, you know, they just want school to be a daycare. The weirdest thing is, like, there's some really smart people, too, who I've seen have this bizarre sort of notion, too. Like I saw Chris Hayes earlier, someone who I genuinely usually think is on point. But he tweeted uh, one of the absolutely weirdest things about the debate on here is people framing in 
in-person public schooling, probably the most important public good provided by the state, as nothing more than some stalking horse for capitalism, just daycare that exists so parents can work. Well, here's the thing. If teachers are saying they can't do their job because of the current... Unbelievable. I think it goes to like, I think that goes to like Matt's point. We are dealing with a new wave of like conservative, like activism or rather conservative uh, definition of freedom that implies that, you know, it's the kind of people who before the pandemic would have, you know, thrown a fit in uh, Starbucks because they didn't say Merry Christmas. The new conservative like performative thing is to be extra virulent, you know, to be extra, extra in your face about how much they don't believe in germs and how much they don't care that you believe in germs. And, you know, Kevin Sorbo is a great example. Two years ago, he was arguing about them not spelling his name right on the Merry Christmas cup in Starbucks. And now he's arguing about the, him having to wear a mask in one. And it's yep. just, you know, it's just unfortunate that like that transition was so easy for some people to make just because it's, you know, on one could say that you could treat bigotry like a germ. But now it's become one for a lot of people legitimately. And it's shown a weakness in our society, I think. Right. They always try to they always try to spin it too. like if, you know, like, oh, I had covid uh, and it wasn't a big deal as if your experience is like anybody else. I mean, we saw it with Joe Rogan, who constantly downplayed it. And then when he got it, he threw the kitchen sink at it and took as many different various different medicines as possible. Funny thing is, Joe Rogan, I, I don't know if you could see I'm not I'm not Brandon or Joe Rogan. I'm kind of scrawny. Uh, my kitchen sink was uh, I can't swallow pills because I'm a baby, but uh, I did take a few uh, chewable Motrin. That was my kitchen yeah, sink. I was, I was going to ask. Crush them up. Yeah. Rogan, what monoclonal antibodies, ivermectin, all this bullshit. Um, I had Dayquil and NyQuil. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I yeah, I, I mean, this is this is me now, Joe Rogan, to you, because you couldn't handle your COVID, I guess. Right. Because that's how we, we determine who's strong or weak. Right. Just ridiculous. The, the, their whole worldview is so warped. It's unbelievable. At one point, I mean, I'm really interested about this. I mean, I know we've seen like we've seen some graphs that show that, you know, what, what vaccination rates are, what COVID infection rates are. Uh, based upon counties that went, you know, 50 percent more for Trump or 50 percent more for for Biden. But we've had now and and I would imagine over the course of the, you know, the next uh, six to eight months, and we're going to have probably a million Americans who are going to die. Uh, we've had over 800,000 now. Uh, could be well over. I would imagine that there are more you know republican voters than democratic voters who have died it'll be interesting to see like when you're talking about the past two presidential elections anyways we're determined really by seventy thousand votes forty thousand votes i mean a hundred and ten thousand votes whatever uh dispersed over the course of of of, of three or four or five uh, states it's going to be interesting to see if these, uh, you know, if someone is going to do a breakdown of just like who died and, uh, you know, is that going to change the outcome? Like, you know, you're talking Michigan and Wisconsin, 10,000, 15,000 votes uh, in the um, uh, the Clinton Trump race. I mean, a million people dispersed amongst 50 states. Just doing the math in the back, uh, you know, it's 20,000 per state. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what the implications uh, of this will be. Um, I can only know. imagine there are going to be a lot of openings at AM radio shows, though, for like, you know. Uh, That's correct. Hosts. That's correct. Now, the, 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 mo the mortality rate amongst that cohort is pretty high. Great time to become an AM conservative talk radio show host. Or a terrible time, depending on, you know, your, your perspective. <laughs> A lot of turnover, a lot of turnover in that business. Uh, so if you're a budding uh, conservative AM talk radio host, there's some openings. Uh, <laughs> the situation they're in, then if you're arguing against them, then you don't really care about the education point of it or even all the other good the schools provide, like a lunch or whatever. If teachers are saying they can't do these very basic things for your children, then you are just someone on the side is I need somewhere for my kid to go so I could get to work. What? I mean, it's that simple. I mean, yeah, I think some of the, you know, the hand wringing about education and learning loss comes across as being quite like, you know, uh, absent or no quite vapid in the sense that like you know we've had education problems in america you know district you know uh issues with inequality issues with funding across the board but you know i think teachers 
as a class of, you know, uh, class professionals provide a unique way to understand like how the working class is segregated. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the pandemic has been watching the working class be further segregated into this population that already exists between like, you know, the work from home, work remotely, people who are able to work in these high tech sort of like, you know, uh, I guess the word they use, the professional uh, managerial class style jobs, like, you know, tech startups versus the people who prior to the pandemic were in roles that were largely meant to service those jobs, you know, delivery drivers, baristas, bartenders, you know, janitors, people who clean the gym, you know, front desk workers. And of course, obviously teachers who provide that role of like putting, sending your kids somewhere for eight hours a day so you can perform, you know, your work. And I think for a lot of people who, op- who you know, who occupy uh, the middle slice of our economic ladder, not the very rich, but the, you know, the upper middle class, middle class, the promise of a permanent servant class of workers is what makes capitalism bearable to them. The idea that, well, yeah, I might not be the CEO of whatever place I work, but I'm not the, you know, I'm not the admin person. I'm not the teacher who takes care of my kids or other people's kids who, you know, we view these jobs largely speaking before the pandemic, before it became essential as jobs that failures did, low skilled workers. And the idea that these low skilled workers are now allowed to say no to you because they were deemed essential during the pandemic is, you know, a violation of that, I think, informal contract that people feel like they were able to, you know, that they were able to rely on before the pandemic. Because we know teachers are parents too. A lot of teachers are parents, a lot of people who like, you know, a lot of people who are saying, oh, well, what am I supposed to do about my job as though teachers are incapable of having children or families that they care about are just like unable to see them as anything other than like a service class. I I think there's also people are being very opportunistic in, in using this as an opportunity to try and demonize uh, teachers unions. Yeah. I mean, because they have too much power. They have, too, they have enough power to tell you how to raise your kids. And that's not something that's allowed in this, uh, you know, even if, you know, the interest in raising the kids in terms of education and like school reform, education reform has not really been there except for on the far right when they were, you know, marching against critical race theory last week. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really funny. Like you actually look at what the studies say about educational attainment and what they say is that we should be expanding public school into summer school because that's when kids really fall behind but of course that's not on the table when you're just trying to attack teachers well i mean that was a lot of what that money i was seeing people respond to chris hayes's tweet last night about like what did we spend all of this money for the billions of dollars that was allocated to schools that are not be that were not for you know whatever ppe or hvac stuff and someone pointed out that it would know a lot of that money went to sort of those like bridging the gap attainment programs like summer schools other types of programs that were not really utilized by a lot of the parents who, you know, travel during the summer or have the option to like take their kids to do something a little bit more fun than summer school and would prefer not to. And so, you know, most people didn't want school for that, didn't want that money for that, even though like that's what educational attainment would speak to. They want it for like the, you know, the nine to five, which is understandable for, you know, the kind of society we've structured. Yep. Um... I don't know. They're, they're, overall, there's this sort of bizarre sort of uh, quality of like you know, people want the people want the the COVID to be something other than it is. <laughs> like, just people want the pandemic over, and they, they you know the the bottom line is the virus is going to do what the virus is going to do. And the, the weirdest thing though is, for the most part though, those people have got in their way. It's like even the small changes are not enough of them, of it being back to life before. Like for the most part, you can do things in this country now. Like they're, like you said, there's no more lockdowns. There's a lot of things that are back to how they were. Yeah, I think there's people are just aggravated by the pandemic. And so they're they're looking, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And if you're Nate Silver and you cannot actually say that we can stop covid it's then you start looking for any slight you know sort of i don't know uh even if you have to create a a a straw man that exists um and i i don't know i mean like look, look at like a you know greenwald going on and saying that there's an addiction to uh the pandemic i mean this is just bizarre I mean, this is beside the point, but I, I had noticed that he also posted something from a, a nurse who was quitting an ICU nurse. And, you know, we've had um, incredible uh, cuts to hospitals and consolidation over the years. But like, this is part of the reason why it's not enough to say, 
COVID's not going to kill as many people as it would have before because of the vaccines is because our hospital systems are breaking. And by saying our hospital systems are breaking, it's not that the, you know, the stethoscopes are getting worn out. It's that the people are getting worn out. Right. It's that we have already overworked, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, nurses and doctors uh, who are staffing these things and they're going to break. They're just going to break as people um, at one point because it's been going on two years of this and it's relentless. So I, it's have you seen have you seen those reports from people who work in like like nurses and doctors, people who work in hospitals where like they're like quitting or on the verge of quitting because they're now getting blamed by anti-vaxxers families for the death of their loved ones, for not giving them ivermectin or whatever they think they like. You know, it's only so much human being can take. And that's what the, they're humans. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, it, it's really like. What's going on with the school stuff is just like those right wingers who freak out when they see someone choose to wear a mask in a place where it's not mandated. You see that so much now. If someone chooses to wear a mask for their own because they feel safe or protected or whatever, right wingers will now harass those people in public if they see that saying, you don't have to wear your mask here, take it off. And it's just like so bizarre. Why do you care? You got your way. It's not being mandated on you. You don't you don't have to wear a mask. Why do you have to cause a problem for the person who chooses to do so? It's I because they just want their way all around. It's not just about their own. It's they, they want everyone else to have to do that, too. What were you going to say, Brandon? I was going to say I was actually surprised and shocked that you didn't wear your mask on stream, even though, you know, we're not in the same room. It would have been polite. <laughs> <laughs> for you to put your mask on. I didn't want to say anything, but since you brought up masking, I just think it's part that you're just being a hypocrite. But, I mean, to Sam's earlier point, I think that, you know, as a country, our media infrastructure up until a point, or media culture rather, up until the point of the pandemic was the kind of system where like we would have a tragedy, a mass shooting, a natural disaster, wildfires. Uh, and, you know, that tragedy would be in the news for about two days, maybe three max, depending on like the aftermath or the fallout and whether or not it could be, you know, accurately politicized or whatever. Um, but then it would go away. It would be able, it would be like buried by some other event, you know, for the majority of America, as opposed to, you know, the people who were actually directly impacted. We have like little pockets of the country who have been directly impacted by like natural disasters from Katrina to Hurricane Maria to, you know, to Sandy Hook that have just been left devastated by those tragedies that we have as a nation, as a nation moved on from because they contradict our story about American exceptionalism and American excellence because, they, you know, they're just anomalous events that happen. I think a lot of people don't like how COVID has just been in the news for the past two years. And you're not allowed, you know, when, there are people who follow follow that account that just tweets about like COVID outbreaks and goes, can you just stop tweeting about COVID outbreaks? It's like, you know, we've just, we've lost or rather we have enculturated in a large portion of our country, the feeling that if a disaster is out of the, yeah, out of sight, it must've been resolved. And since, you know, we have like to put, you know, COVID out of sight for, you know, it's impossible for some people in their minds to pretend like it's resolved. Yep. It's crazy. I almost got into a physical fight with um, a guy over uh, over break. I was helping a friend who was getting a uh, moving cross country, move the stuff in. The mover wouldn't wear a mask. And um, we got into a little bit of an argument about it. And uh, he told me that God will take care. The mask is not doing anything. He was a Russian guy. Uh, and uh, he told me that the mat that God was going to take care of it, and um, and I'd, and then I suggested that maybe God would also provide him his tip. So <laughs> you got to stick up to those Russians, Sam. Tipping them anyways, but uh, still, it was like, what kind of effing moron comes in? And we always like, wear your mask inside. <laughs>